Hello everybody, uh, greetings from downtown Beijing. Uh, right behind me is the iconic CCTV tower and a uh, very happy Lunar New Year to everyone. Uh, as you can see, China is uh, just uh, reeling from a week of celebrations. Um, I thought I'd use this moment uh, to share with you uh, my thoughts on how to think about uh, China and uh, how to think about um, how China will play out uh, given uh, some of the difficulties uh, it's going through currently. I've been doing business in China since 2000 and in all that time uh, my big challenge has been to be able to evaluate China uh, independently uh, and fairly uh, for what it wants to achieve as a country and then also to take into account um, the fundamentals, the elements that uh, we need to examine again independently uh, and fairly uh, to try and project uh, what China has achieved and what it will be achieving uh, well into the future. In 2003, I remember a very important conversation I had with uh, two very influential people in Washington DC uh, where they were talking about uh, geopolitics and they said uh, at that time uh, the US was uh, preparing for war with Iraq and uh, they said that it will cost a billion dollars a month and that the US can afford it. And in that conversation, they said that they were worried about the NPL, the non-performing loans uh, situation in China in 2003. I fast forward to today, and then I think about what actually had ended up happening. The war in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan cost the US $9 trillion, and all it did was destroy two countries. Uh, and destroyed many lives in the U.S. Uh, and created uh, a hangover of um, pension commitments to veterans and so on. And then the U.S. went through the 2008 crisis, while China uh, just kept growing. Uh, you know, uh, well into about 2014 or so, uh, it was uninterrupted growth uh, of the economy. And that NPL situation, the non-performing loans of the banking industry, uh, that was treated very interestingly, put into two huge asset management companies. And as long as the economy was growing, they were able to rehabilitate uh, a lot of the bad assets. And of course, every year, uh, uh, bad assets keep getting formed and so on. And at the same time, uh, China ramped up its ability to borrow. Uh, and uh, debt as a percentage of GDP went up from something like 70% uh, to about nearly 300%, uh, which is where it is. But China used that money very well to build incredible infrastructure, breathtaking infrastructure, national infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that created, uh, uh, you know, created uh, productivity, enabled productivity, uh, smoothened the transition of um, rural urban migration, uh, made the population a lot more mobile uh, and, um, and set the stage uh, for infrastructure that will be amortized over many more years to come. And it's world-class infrastructure. It is uh, a developed country by any measure. And then I think about uh, what is going on today and how do I read China and uh, and uh, what should I pay attention to now if you if you uh, are a fan of uh, geopolitical uh, analysts like Peter Zehan for example uh, and there are a few American uh, geopolitical geopolitical uh, analysts uh, who say things like China will collapse in 10 years uh, he's saying that right now by the way uh, but the interesting thing is that he's been saying that since 2005. Uh, and then uh, China didn't collapse in 2005. It's, in fact, it went on growing from a you know a few trillion dollar economy to 11 to 12 trillion 
uh, you know, and, and almost uh, to the point of uh, overtaking the US economy. So then the question is, the question to ask people like Peter Zehan is, what did we miss, you know, uh, in that last 15 years or so, uh, that you were saying that China was going to collapse and it didn't collapse. Uh, what accounted for its ability to continue growing and its ability to, um, you know, continue amassing debt, but uh, also to build the incredible infrastructure that it has in place. Someone pointed out to me that actually, to some extent, uh, the Chinese government is uh, incredibly transparent about its objectives. Uh, and it needs to be transparent uh, because uh, it has to communicate with its people uh, what its goals are uh, and uh, the milestones it's put in place and also communicate to the local governments uh, the KPIs that it has in place that needs to be achieved. Uh, and we uh, don't pay attention to the five-year plans that the government puts in place or the, the government's uh, slogans uh, such as common prosperity. Uh, we ignore them at our peril. Because when this government says that it wants to achieve common prosperity, it means it, okay? Uh, and I guess that's where they are right now, uh, that is under the current leadership. Uh, it wants to ameliorate the effect of uh, unbridled uh, capital markets uh, on an economy and create a society that is sustainable uh, and that is equitable. Uh, you know, across regions, across uh, social classes, across uh, the ability to uh, earn an income, and so on. Now, I can see them working at it, and I can see that it's a noble goal, but to achieve that, uh, there is a price to pay. Uh, so the question we are here to answer today is, Will China be able to pay that price? Now, when I look at the uh, when I look at the achievements of China since about 2000, because 2001 was when China became a member of the WTO, and it used that membership really well to become the largest manufacturer of everything around the world. 140 countries around the world uh, have China. Uh, as their most important trading partners uh, and uh, very important, right? Uh, they are in most of those countries, most of the 140 countries are at a trade deficit with China, meaning that uh, China exports more to these countries than import from them. And you know something, by the way, uh, I'm a history buff uh, and I go back in the history of China and actually this whole situation was, is a repeat of something that was achieved uh, in, the, in the early years of the Ming Dynasty, by the way. Um, and I'll, I'm happy to discuss that with anyone, uh, you know, on a separate occasion. Um, the development of China uh, and the ability to fund its growth uh, was driven by three infrastructures or three pillars uh, of uh, society. Uh, private enterprise, uh, private enterprise that was capitalized by foreign capital uh, and state-owned enterprises. By private enterprise, I mean the factories, the hard-working people in the south of China uh, who are willing to uh, be able to manufacture everything and who are adept enough to uh, embrace new technologies uh, and, uh, and become the lowest cost manufacturer of everything uh, around the world. In fact, China, you know, in the Ming Dynasty, it was proselyte. Uh, today, it's uh, just about any manufactured goods. Um, and China was exporting that around the world, okay? Uh, then comes a stroke of uh, fortune, which is that the advent of the internet uh, and platform economy uh, and China being a darling of the investment community created the likes of Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, and so on uh, that were incredibly well capitalized uh, by Western capital. And then the third is the state-owned enterprises. And even if the state-owned enterprises are inefficient, uh, 
uh, to some extent uh, and had to be rehabilitated and repurposed and so on, uh, they did build a lot of the infrastructure that we see around us. Uh, you know, and, and the roads and the railways, 40,000 kilometers of high speed railway in 12 to 15 years. Okay. I mean, it's, it's something that has never been achieved by any other country before, uh, and maybe will never be achieved ever again, uh, in any other economy. Now, uh, the middle layer, the, the, internet companies that were funded by global capital or US capital a lot uh, did create in my view a cascading effect that is when a Alibaba for example has a market capitalization of say 800 billion more than 800 billion dollars at one time that capital comes into China and then creates a cascading effect of capitalizing other layers of innovations uh, in a city like Hangzhou uh, and then uh, spread out to other cities. And of course, Baidu is in Beijing and so on. Uh, and today, Alibaba is uh, capitalized to about, I think the market cap is about a uh, little less than 200 billion. So it lost uh, about uh, $400 billion worth of capital as a result of uh, the tensions that are underway at the moment. So the question now is, how will the state be able to fund uh, its ambitions for common prosperity? Okay, the ambition itself is noble, uh, but a price has to be paid, and the question is, how is China going to navigate that? I would say, don't underestimate China's ability to find an answer. Uh, something that I've discovered, and I think. I don't brag when I say that, you know, I talk to some of the top uh, economists in China. Um, all of them uh, have an influence uh, on the state. Uh, they, they are considered to be advisors uh, to the state council, to, to the various um, government bodies, and some of them are think tanks. Uh, and something I detect is that China has an incredible, um, you know, focus on making sure that it didn't make or doesn't make the mistakes that Japan did in its own uh, progress uh, into industrialization. Uh, and it also learns from Japan because when you think about countries like Japan, Korea, and even Germany after the World War II, it was a interesting uh, collaboration between the state uh, and private enterprise where the state uh, directed credit to the private enterprise that it wanted to promote and the private enterprises themselves were very export driven uh, and that's how Germany became the largest manufacturer of cars and, and Japan as well and uh, industrial equipment and today uh, Samsung in Korea uh, is a global manufacturer of chips uh, and so on. So that formula is being replicated in China right now um, and uh, by directing capital and credit, uh, the state uh, wants to champion specific industries. And it has had a few successes. Uh, the EV car phenomenon, which we are all very surprised about, that China is now the world's largest uh, producer of EV cars, and that uh, it, it now uh, you know, surpasses uh, everything else in the global marketplace. Uh, the Europeans, the Japanese, the Koreans uh, are ham hamstrung, and Americans with Tesla are hamstrung because the Chinese players uh, are dominating the market, and very clearly they will uh, dictate and define the market uh, in the next 10 years or so. It's a, it's a, it's a cost that is, uh, and is already determined. It's a, uh, it's a battle that's already won uh, in that regard. And there will be a few other battles. I see them winning the battle in, in battery technology and so on. I don't see them, I don't see China winning the AI battle uh, because very simply, in my view, uh, you cannot be a purveyor of information or uh, of the information era uh, if you think you can 
curate information, that you can censor information, that you can um, decide uh, you know, what information uh, is good for society and so on. Um, so because it tries to second guess what about information it wants to play with, um, it will not ever be uh, a leader in that regard. Okay? Um, and this is my assessment. Uh, it can be a, a close follower, uh, it can curate information that it wants for itself, uh, but to be a leader, a global leader, is, uh, is, uh, requires the kind of ability to absorb uh, dissent uh, in the local, in local society uh, and, and, uh, and, and be able to still function as a stable society. And that's a price that China uh, is not willing to pay. Uh, so these are my initial thoughts. I will come back uh, with more thoughts as we go along. But these are the thoughts with which I'm structuring my thinking. So I'm paying attention to what the intention of the state is, uh, and then uh, asking myself whether the state has the ability uh, to fund uh, its objectives. Uh, and that ability to fund uh, is predicated by a number of uh, first principles. And the first first principle is that uh, this is a country that's been built on exporting. So its ability to continue being the world's manufacturing engine uh, is central uh, to that ability to fund uh, its own common prosperity. Uh, of course, it also wants to uh, become a state where domestic consumption is a driver. Uh, there are a number of social pillars that China needs to build uh, for that to happen. So, social pensions, uh, you know, the ability to education, the ability for uh, the confidence that local people have in spending, the trust in the state. Uh, these are soft uh, infrastructure that the state needs to uh, invest in the rule of law uh, and you know the, the, the predictability of the rule of law and so on uh, there's a lot of work to be done on that front I think that China has missed the opportunity to build some of these social infrastructures when the economy was uh, growing uh, at a clip uh, and to build that now uh, might cause uh, you know some segments of society to uh, to push back and to uh, to ask for you know for concessions and so on. So I think that there are issues in that way. There there are headwinds. Now, when you listen to me, what do you think you're hearing? Are you hearing somebody who is pro-China or anti-China? I hope you're not hearing that at all. Um, I hope you're hearing somebody who refuses to put a country's uh, social ambitions into a political framework. To call something communist or socialist or capitalist is to miss the point uh, of what a country needs to achieve uh, you know, uh, as a national objective. And for most parts, and I come from East Asia, from Southeast Asia, and I've seen this in the countries in my region as well, for the most parts, uh, the state just wants to be agnostic about um, about ideology uh, and uh, very focused on common good, and that um, that its populations have have uh, ability to uh, to to build uh, uh, themselves personally and, and as an economy, and to respond uh, to new challenges as the economy evolves. So, uh, these are my thoughts. Uh, wish you all very well and uh, please uh, respond to my thinking and uh, I hope to build on the things that I've said today. Here we have a view of the rest of the city.